Hello and welcome to the Thursday, February 9th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. This is also the 8th anniversary of this podcast, so if you like it, if you listen to this regularly, then uh, please let your friends know and also I appreciate good reviews left on iTunes or whatever other service you're using to listen to this. Today we got a guest diary by Remco Verhoff about uh, metadata URLs that you commonly find in cloud servers. They exist in pretty much all of the big cloud providers and are URLs that are accessible via 169.254 IP addresses. So really they're only accessible from the system itself because these are non-routable IP addresses. But once on the system or connecting from the system, you will have access to a number of details about the infrastructure the cloud server is hosted on. It's a little bit like system utilities like PS or Netstat and the like that allow you to interrogate the system state. Now, the reason we have this diary is really just to foster some awareness about these metadata URLs that exist and how to block access to them from your server. With IP tables, you can actually limit access to root. So only root is allowed to access this URL. And that way, if for whatever reason, an attacker is able to relay connections through your system, this particular URL is protected. And earlier this week, I talked about the Cisco Meraki recall of their switches and security appliances. It turns out that this problem may actually be more widespread and not be limited to Cisco. The root cause, according to an article in the register, appears to be Intel's Atom C2000 processor line. There are a number of different processors that are part of that family. And the clock in these chips apparently wears out and after about two years or less of continuous use the chip just stops working now Synology their disk storage devices is another product that has reported failures that are linked uh, to this particular issue but it's uh, not limited to this at all uh, there's a long list of companies that use this particular processor you often find them sort of in somewhat lower end uh, kind of uh, servers and the like The article does mention NetGate, Netgear, HP, NEC, and a bunch of other companies, uh, Supermicro also, that are using this particular processor in various products and that may be affected by this flaw. So overall, if you know of a product that you own that is based on this particular uh, CPU, it's probably time to get in touch with the manufacturer and see if they have any replacement plans and uh, certainly make sure you have a backup. And with the tax filing season being in full swing here in the US, Sophos is reporting about increase in W-2 scams. This is really sort of a variation of phishing, sometimes business email compromise, where an email arrives that claims to come from the CEO. It's directed at an accountant within the organization, and it's asking for copies of all W-2s or other tax documents. The idea here is identity theft. Uh, These documents can then be used to, for example, file fraudulent tax returns. And if that isn't bad enough, Sophos is reporting that they have recently also seen attackers coming back after the first attack and then doing a more traditional business email compromise where they're trying to trick the accountant into wiring money to an account that the attacker controls. Again, these emails are all coming apparently from the CEO. As a first step to defend against uh, this kind of attack, you have to make sure that nobody from outside your network is able to spoof your domains, your company's email address. So SPF records and the like are really important to prevent some of this. In some cases, the attacker may use lookalike domains or not fake the domain at all. Still makes it less likely then to succeed. And of course, the next step aside from 
from user education is also two-factor authentication so any credentials that are leaked in scams like this can't be used to log into critical systems and word macro malware has finally arrived for the mac overall works well of course very similar to what we have seen in the windows world where the user has to open a word document and enable macros now slight deviation here from the windows world the macro actually decodes into python code that's not what usually happens on windows because you are less likely to find python installed the code even does check for popular Mac OS security software like Little Snitch and just having the software installed will exit this particular version. Of course, there's no guarantee that this will be true for future versions of this software. The Python code can then easily be modified to download additional malware and the persistence mechanisms that have been observed here are that it adds itself as a cron job, it hijacks the dylib and adds itself as a launch daemon. It also adds a login hook, so various methods that will ensure that the malware keeps on running even after the system is rebooted. Well, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.